Camelot Drive in Huntsville, Alabama, epitomized the idyllic middle-class lifestyle where manicured lawns glistened and bicycles lay unchained. Yet, in 1998, this serene backdrop was marred by an act of violence that shook its foundation. It was a chilly evening on March 10th when tragedy struck. 17-year-old Jeffrey Franklin unleashed a horrific assault within the walls of the family home. A hatchet, a hefty sledgehammer, a rat tail file, and a butcher's knife were the brutal tools of havoc used as he turned on his own family, attacking his parents, Cynthia and Gerald, and his younger siblings, Sarah, Timothy, and Christopher. On that fateful afternoon, a friend of Sarah Franklin approached the house. She was coming to visit her friend, and she was close enough to the family to just knock on the door and walk into the house. And upon opening it, she was confronted by Jeffrey, who was just stood there, drenched in blood, with no top on. He lunged at her, but she managed to escape, her feet carrying her as fast as they could to safety at her parents' home, from where the police were swiftly alerted. Responding officers were met with a house of terror, with bodies brutalized and left throughout the house, but there was no sign of Jeffrey Franklin. One veteran officer said, after 16 years, this is the worst I've seen. This case shocked me, just by how open the killer is about his crimes that were against his own flesh and blood. He basically spelt it out to the investigators. But before we dive in, I want to let you know about my second channel called Grim Tales, where I am covering true stories that are shocking but not murderous. I think if you find this content interesting, then you should go and see what's over there. Link to the channel is in the comments. And don't forget to like this video if you want to see my next one. It really helps me out. Thank you. This video is created solely for educational and documentary purposes. It does not endorse or condone the criminal actions described within. Franklin, during his adolescence, was already receiving psychological care. He had been consulting with a psychiatrist to address his attention deficit disorder and depression for which he received prescriptions for Ritalin, Prozac, and Clonopin. In the days leading up to the tragic event, he reportedly stayed awake for a continuous span of three days, as he was misusing Ritalin, taking excessive amounts at a time. Through Franklin's own admission, he said he knew he had a substance problem, but the doctors kept on prescribing him more. Several students at Grimson High School, where Jeffrey was a student, said that he was involved in devil worship. Jenny Smith, a classmate, said of him, and quote, He was really smart, a nice person, up until about two years ago. He just changed into a different person. I don't know why. His attitude was different. He was always in a bad mood and had a really short temper. She described an incident during a discussion about God in their government class, which had convinced her that he worshipped the devil. Mark Dunham, another student, mentioned that Franklin had a habit of making unsettling claims about casting spells on his classmates. Adam Salyers, another one of the students, said that Franklin spoke openly about his substance abuse, predominantly Ritalin. Jeffrey Franklin's mother, Cynthia, told fellow staff members at the Valley View Nursing Home and Rehabilitation Center where she worked that Franklin's actions had been putting a strain on his family for the past 18 months. She even spoke to her pastor who told her that Franklin was going through a temporary phase. Franklin's parents tried everything they could Doctors were treating him with medication for depression. Yet, when there was no improvement, 
they simply increase the dosage. Concern arose when the medication began to be used faster than expected. His mother, Cynthia, suspected misuse and secured the medication in a lockbox. Nonetheless, Franklin gained access to the substances by disassembling the lockbox's hinges and swapping the medication with lookalike saccharine tablets, all going undetected by his mother. This substance abuse drove Franklin deep into a psychosis. His lawyer described him as, and quote, crazy. But to try and balance this and not blame all of Franklin's actions simply on substance abuse, I want to refer to what District Attorney Brassard said, and quote, you hear Ritalin abuse that produced this horrible result. I will admit that certain substance abuse will exacerbate what is residing in somebody. He said, it's not common to see substance abuse produce the results seen in the Franklin case. But I'll admit, I think it greases the kid, so to speak. When somebody of that nature is amped up on something, it's a bad deal. It's a power keg. Two weeks before the murders, tension was running high in the Franklin household. The father, Jerry Franklin, confided in a friend that Jeffrey had said that he was going to murder the whole family. Jerry was obviously alarmed by this statement, but did not think his family was in any imminent danger. Leading up to the murders, Franklin stayed awake for three days, high on Ritalin and in his room, drawing out a plan to murder his whole family and gathering the weapons to do so. This proves that the murders were not a snap decision from a young man who was high, but a well thought out and deliberate act. On that fateful evening, on March 10th, 1998, the investigation painted a grim sequence of events. Jeffrey's initial act of violence was directed at his mother, whom he fatally stabbed with the rat tail file. His sister was next, sustaining life-threatening injuries from a hatchet that both slashed and bludgeoned her head and throat. Upon his father's arrival to the home, Jeffrey met him with a sledgehammer, delivering multiple fatal blows to the head. The brutality continued as he turned the hatchet on his younger brothers, attacking them with the same merciless intent. They suffered severe wounds to their skulls and throats. They were all left in piles of their own blood. Once this was done, everyone in the house was seemingly dead. Franklin had one more sister, but fortunately, she was at a dance class during the onslaught. But Franklin was at home, waiting for her to return. This is when a friend of his sister entered through the back door, encountering Franklin drenched in blood and shirtless. He must have been a harrowing sight. He lunged for her, but she managed to escape, and now Franklin's plans needed to change, as he knew that the authorities would soon be on their way, and he was right. Upon arrival, the first responder was greeted by a silence that belied the chaos inside the Franklin residence. A blue Geo Metro sat ominously in the driveway, but the officer went to the house where the distressed call was made. By the time a second officer had arrived at the Franklin house, the car was gone. The officers, expecting to tend to a single injured youth, had brought only one ambulance and an urban responder car. The reality was far grimmer. Inside, they found Gerald and Cynthia dead at the scene. Victims of a brutal tragedy, Sarah, Timmy and Christopher were barely clinging to life. Their conditions were very precarious. In a race against time, they were taken away to the hospital, their fates hanging in the balance. Jeffrey had vanished by the time the authorities realized the extent of the catastrophe. An urgent all points bulletin was dispatched for the Blue Geo Metro. He led the police on a harrowing high speed chase through the residential streets of Southeast Huntsville. 
displaying a dangerous disregard for life as he aggressively attempted to force the pursuing officers off the road, in which he managed to do once, forcing an officer's car slamming into a nearby church's garden. The pursuit reached its abrupt end when Jeffrey's reckless driving led him into a collision with a fence. His arrest was disturbingly captured by his own unsettling laughter and mockery directed at bystanders and blatant disrespect shown to a photographer. In the biting cold, he stood shirtless, revealing ominous symbols carved into his skin, a pitchfork and a pentagram. This spoke volumes for his troubled state. The officers searched the house and made a chilling discovery. Franklin's notebook, a dark journal outlining his sinister plans. In the three days building up to the tragedy, he had written not only his macabre fantasies involving torture, but also detailed various satanic rituals. Most disturbingly, it contained explicit plans for the annihilation of his family, a premeditated blueprint laid out in his own hand. It read, and quote, I know dad will be home at this time, and I'm going to be. I'll wait by the front door, behind the little hutch, and I'll hit him with a hammer. Mum will be out on a walk. When she comes back, I'll have the radio playing loudly. I'll call my mom in the room and ask her what's on the agenda for today. Then I'll kill her. And what about the brothers and sisters? Well, I'll take them. I'll strangle my little brother in his room and I'll lure my other little brother into this room and I'll strangle him. Then my sister, I will force myself on her. Then I will finish her off. Even if they do catch me, I'll plead insanity and fool those stupid judges and prosecutors. He gave no reason as to why they had to die, but he did write, they must die one by one. Although his parents died at the scene, the three siblings he attacked all managed to survive, albeit with life-altering injuries. During the interrogation, Franklin had a volatile demeanor and was largely withholding information. The investigator attempted a different approach, sketching the layout of the Franklin residence to elicit a response and requested Franklin to mark where he last encountered his family members. Rather than providing a straightforward answer, Franklin, took the pencil from the investigator and began to scrawl a continuous loop encircling the entirety of the sketched house. The pencil moved in relentless spirals until Franklin abruptly stopped and dropped the pencil. It was then that Franklin's behavior took a hostile turn. He became verbally aggressive, rising to his feet and hurling abuse at the investigators effectively terminating the interview. In the end, 17-year-old Jeffrey Franklin was not going to outsmart the investigators and he began to talk. Although he admitted being in the house at the time of the murders, he denied being the killer. Instead, he said, and quote, some evil being had taken over his body. A blood test taken 12 days after Jeffrey's arrest confirmed he had 10 times the normal dose of Ritalin in his bloodstream. Franklin's defense lawyer said his actions were, and quote, deranged. Franklin was held in Madison County District Court on charges of capital murder and attempted murder. He entered a not guilty plea. In 2001, he took a deal where he pleaded guilty to two murder charges and three counts of attempted murder to which he would serve three life sentences. Franklin said, I hope and pray that one day my family can forgive me for the things that I have done and I know that may take a long time. I know that God has already forgiven me. Under Alabama law, a person is eligible for parole after serving 15 years of a life sentence and Franklin has so far been denied twice once in 2016 and again in 2021. 
In 2013, Franklin sent a letter to the courts, looking to state his case in a bid for freedom. Part of it read, I'm not really a bad man. I didn't need to do what I did. It just happened. He then later gave an interview, where he spoke about his reasonings for what happened that night. He said, and quote, When I was on the street and going through high school and stuff, I got involved in the occult, actually satanic worship. The main reason was because of the music I was listening to. I was really against God and everything he stood for. People of mental illness have delusions at the time when they're doing something like this. I had some delusions, but they were based on, roughly on, this music I was listening to and stuff like that. I got really confused and it was a strange set of circumstances. I felt that I was forced to commit this crime. Franklin will be available for parole again in 2026. It's a tough one for me as he did try and murder his entire family and for that he should spend the rest of his life behind bars. But at the same time, he was clearly very mentally unwell at the time of the crime. How do you feel about this? Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane.